गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वी वेलकम यू ऑल टू ऑर्थो टीवी ऑनलाइन मंडे मोटिवेशन वेबिनार सीरीज एंड टू इंट्रोड्यूस टूडे स्पीकर Okay good evening and warm welcome to Monday motivation series this is the 46th episode of this program it's my pleasure to introduce my senior colleague and today's speaker professor dr michael goldberg he is retired as clinical professor of orthopedics at the university of washington school of medicine at seattle currently he is attached to the swartz center for compassionate healthcare his main interest is to prevent burnout in healthcare professionals and in medical staff burnout is an epidemic and healthcare worker we all know that and it's a serious problem as serious as the covid dr goldberg was a president of pediatric orthopedic society of north america he also held a leadership position at american academy of pediatrics he was awarded a honorary membership in the pediatric orthopedic society of brazil and italy and i am very happy to say that he was the first american to receive this honor dr goldberg has lectured widely both nationally and internationally he has authored more than 70 peer reviewed scientific article and also a book on the dysmorphic child which is his specialty he is very famous in pediatric orthopedic group and famous for his work the question is asking are we really helping our patients and if yes how do we know that so his this question is very pertinent for everyone but today is going to speak on a topic which is very close to his heart and that is the role of compassion in our lives so he is going to speak mainly for the keeping the healthcare people in the mind but in addition to that he will speak also for the non medical people that how compassion is very important for us so with this small introduction i now request professor goldberg to share his experience with us thank you over to you michael thank you very much and it is a, a privilege for me Uh, to talk with you about the role of compassion in our lives. Um, I want to start with the conclusion of our conversation, and that is that when you practice compassion, you reduce the suffering in your patients and their families. And when you practice compassion, you improve the lives. of your coworkers and when you practice compassion you strengthen your own well-being so today i'm going to talk to all caregivers and i use the word caregiver to mean anyone who touches the patient either directly or indirectly anyone who is a nurse medical assistants physicians surgeons healthcare workers who do translation or transport we are all caregivers and though therefore all of us to have compassion as important in their lives so i want to start with a story a very personal one uh, james was my first patient It was September of 1962. I was a third-year medical student at Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, and James was a 50-year-old African American man who had what was called at that time malignant hypertension, a type of high blood pressure resistant to all medications available at that time. He was the first person to call me doctor perhaps except for my mother who also did so to try to encourage my career even as a little boy One evening as I was leaving the ward to go home James called out doc I'm going to die I'm going to die I reassured him that all his lab tests were now normal his urine output has picked up his blood pressure 
was coming down. The, the next morning, when I came in, James was dead. His bed was empty and his body was in the morgue and I was stunned. My kindly old professor tried to make a teaching moment, say, always listen to your patients. And I repeated it to my medical students for almost 50 years. But each time I told it, each time I thought about James, it was like picking a scab off an old wound that would not heal. I've come to realize and only recently talk about it, that what I felt then was guilt and shame. I was an imposter. I tried to ease his fear with facts. I held out his EKD strip. I could have held his hand. He wanted a relationship. He wanted not to be alone. I wanted an A in my first clinical clerkship. So James has weighed on me. I may have met his medical needs, but I failed to fulfill my social contract with him. I failed to nourish the doctor-patient relationship. I failed to offer compassion. And both of us suffered needlessly because of that. So what is compassion? Compassion is the deep feeling that arises when confronted with another's suffering and coupled with a strong desire to alleviate that suffering. It is feeling what you see when a patient is suffering and it's linked to your desire to relieve, mitigate that suffering. We all have it and we're actually all hardwired for it. And if I might give a one minute course in neuroscience, we know that MRIs visualize <laughs> structures. They see a brain tumor or an infarct, but functional MRIs visualize function. So if we did a functional MRI about hand grasp, we would see a light up in the brain as we're initiating this movement. And then we'd see a light up in the brain in another area as we began the grasp and then lighting up in another as it's released. So it looks at the function from thinking about it to doing. Functional MRIs also picture complex emotional states. So for example, the functional MRI of someone with schizophrenia looks quite different than the functional MRI of someone who does not have schizophrenia and looks different than someone with depression. So what happens with empathy and compassion? What we see when we have empathy, this feeling of, of, of recognizing suffering in someone, there's a core neural network that lights up in the pain center, right next to the pain center, the physical pain center, is this emotional center. It's one neuron over. And when we mitigate that suffering, when we do the compassion, we see it lights up in an area where we have positive affect and positive reward. We feel fulfilled. We feel engaged when delivering compassionate care. We recall our altruism, why we went into healthcare to begin with. That reward center is lighting up as we practice compassionate care. It's sustaining, it's additive, it's not distracting. And at the same time that we are reducing the suffering of others, we are nourishing our own well being. So when patients receive compassionate care, they have better clinical outcomes. In studies with those who have diabetes, and if the patient scores their doctor as having a high sense of compassion and empathy, they have improved control of the hemoglobin 1AC. They have fewer hospitalizations. 
They have fewer serious complications. And in studies with patients with cancer, if the patient perceives their doctor as being compassionate, they have improved psychological adjustment. They have decreased ICU at the end of life and they have an improved immune response. And when physicians deliver compassionate care, our studies in the United States show that there is more job satisfaction, there is more engagement, and they report far less burnout. So compassion is the antidote for burnout. However, here's the problem. If we ask pa patients, are you receiving compassionate care? Fewer than 50% say yes. And if we ask clinicians and caregivers, if their healthcare system is providing compassionate care, only 47% of physicians say yes. And fewer than 40% of nurses say yes. 60% are saying the healthcare system is not providing compassionate care. And these studies, which were done at the Schwartz Center, were before COVID. So what can we do about this? What can we do about us delivering compassionate care and trying to have systems deliver compassionate care. I know external factors affect the care we deliver. I know we want to work in a system where compassionate care is valued, where systems are in place that make it easy for us to deliver compassionate care. Easy for us to not be bogged down with documentation and other system problems. We all know that our inability to offer optimal care and alleviate suffering is a source of our mental distress and our burnout. But let's today not talk about system change, nor about things over which we have no control. Today, let's talk about compassion in our own lives how to deliver it, and how to nourish both our patients and ourselves. So I'd like you to do a 30 second exercise. I would like you to think about an experience in which you observed compassionate healthcare, or maybe an experience where you yourself experienced compassionate healthcare. What did that person do or say or make that compassion? What words were said? What behaviors? So think about that for a brief pause. Write down the word if it's easiest for you. Say it to yourself. Picture those circumstances. And as we're doing this, I will say that compassionate, compa compassionate care and being compassionate isn't defined by us. It's defined by patients and families. What do they say that they're receiving compassionate care? They say they feel there's empathy and kindness towards me and my family. They say there is attentiveness and presence of the doctor, of the nurse, of the interpreter, of the clinic clerk. They were kind, they were attentive, they were there for me. That there was an understanding of my needs, of my concerns that there was non-judgmental listening, attentive listening, non-judgmental curiosity, that these 
practitioners and clinicians acted in my interest. They recognized my uniqueness and my illness in context. So it's the feeling cared for and cared about, attentiveness of the physician and nurse, listening, acting in my interest, seeing me as a patient, as a person, not just as a disease. So how, how do we make that happen? How could we do that? And I'd like you to think about a few behaviors you may try. First, center yourself before entering the room or the cubicle. We're all taking time to wash, Purell. Take those 20 seconds to really think about why you're here. Think about it while you're feeling the surfaces of your hand and concentrate on you being present. Introduce yourself and ask the patient and family, how do they wish to be called? By their given name, by a nickname, by their last name. Sit down, be eye to eye. Don't stand over patients. I know we, many of us look after children, you just have to sit down at a little lower stool. Be aware that we communicate both verbally and non-verbally, and so do patients. Get a sense of the room, not only hear their words, but see if it matches their face, their emotion, and be aware of yourself the same way. Try to ask what matters. I was taught you begin with chief complaint, and I would like it to be instead, what is your chief concern? When we see a, a, a worker, who has had a injury to his finger and a small fracture in a phalanx. It's very different than if that person is a musician. When we see patients, it's torn ACL. Well, there's a difference between someone who is only way to get into school is through athletics as compared to the weekend 40 year old who breaks his ACL. So what matters? What matters to the patient and family? What's your chief concern? Be an attentive listener. In a wonderful study done in Chicago, they filmed multi-specialties when they entered to see a patient for the first time, a new visit. And the doctors would ask, what brings you here? What's your chief complaint? And then the patient started talking and they timed how long was the patient or family allowed to talk before the doctor interrupted. In orthopedic surgeons, it was 19 seconds. We gave the patient 19 seconds. Shall we time 19 seconds? Okay, you've said enough. It's now my turn to start interrupting. Be an attentive listener. When you're talking about patients at handoff, when you're talking about ma making rounds to your colleagues or your students are talking, your residents, tell them to describe the patient as who they are. The worst is the femur fracture, but it's not even as good to say 
a 34 year old black woman, we can see skin color, we can guess age. Why not say something about the patient? A, this 34 year old woman, mother of three, works as a seamstress, lives in the inner city, broke her femur. Why don't we describe patients who are in longer term care, that they're not just afflicted with cancer, but it's a grandmother, a parent, a professional musician, an athlete. What are three things about the patient that we know that is that patient? Three things. And I would say that reminding ourselves of that will put the patient into, into context. Another thing, we do OR permission all the time. But we read it down like all complications are the same. Let me tell you a quick story. For those who are opera fans, you may know the name of Jose Carreras, the great opera singer, who in the late 1980s, early 1990s, developed leukemia. And he was actually treated in Seattle, Washington, with one of the first bone marrow transplants that were done in the 80s and 90s for leukemia. That bone marrow transplant was different than today. What was done is they took broad bore needles and sucked out your bone marrow after there had been some induction and all the bone marrow was sucked out of the various bones and then it was treated. And in the meantime, the patient had body irradiation and then the bone marrow was pushed, squoze back into the bones. Jose Carreras had that procedure done under local, not under general. Why? Because there was a 1% risk that he would have permanent hoarseness after being intubated following an operation. That was too much for him. That was too much. So when we do our consent with patients, do we ask them what complication matters to you? What matters to you? What is your fear? And try to deal with that. And that already makes a more meaningful, a more meaningful connection and going forward. And we all want to emphasize that we may not be able to cure, but we're certainly able to comfort and to heal. And we're certainly able to give the patient and families that we will not abandon you. In addition to these behaviors, really the only way you can do them actively, I might add, is if you take care of yourself. You may have heard of the term compassion fatigue. Nurses describe it as a kind of a work-related uh, distress, exhaustion. And I would argue that compassion does not cause fatigue. It energizes it. So what's going on with these nurses and aides and some doctors who report this fatigue and exhaustion. And I would say that if we think about empathy, empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings with others, of others. It's our ability to cognitively understand. And it's also an emotional response to their suffering. 
when there's an emotional response, it's critically important that we separate ourselves from our patient. I have seen it, it, nurses on the front line, nurses in palliative care, nurses who become the patient. They have emotional exhaustion of their empathy. It's empathy distress. And that, that is what exhausts people. We must may be able to maintain self and others. Otherwise, indeed, it would be exhausted. Remember, you can't, you can't pour from an empty teapot. So what fills that teapot is compassion. Reducing the suffering of others is how we sustain compassion and how we refill that compassion for ourselves. It's in the positive reward. So what do I mean when I say take care of yourself and have this awareness? There are certain self-care practices that in any, a number of randomized trials have shown to be effective. Exercise, eating healthy, sufficient sleep, sometimes mindfulness or meditation. Take a checklist. How much sleep did you have last night? Did you miss a meal? How many? And the meals you ate, how were they? Try to recall good things. Brian Sexton, who is a psychologist at Duke University in North Carolina in the US, has a program called Three Good Things. You can actually log on to it and Google it. And it gives you a program whereby each night before you're going to bed, think of three good things. And they don't have to be monumental like I was just promoted to professor. They can be, boy, I had a wonderful cup of coffee. I, that kid made me laugh. I saw a great sunset and write it down. He has shown that this recognizing three good things is important. Bad things scream, good things whisper. And so try to hear it and say it and do it. The other thing that's quite important is we don't work alone. We work in teams. And it's how do we view our team? How do we nourish compassion in our teams? The greatest inhibitor to individual caregivers showing compassion is that they themselves are disrespected. What can we do to nourish compassion in one another? It's interesting in studies of performance of teams, not only in medicine, but in uh, related industries. If we, if we look at local leaders, team leaders, we find that the performance of the team is dependent on team members' assessment of the leader's compassion. Those leaders that score high in compassion have higher performing teams. And so what might we do as leaders as we all are? Try to reinforce psychological safety. Psychological safety is when a worker can speak up without fear of retribution. Speak up without fear of retaliation. Speak up and feel comfortable doing so. And feel comfortable doing so. That has been shown to be one of the most important things to improve safety in the operating room. But what goes along with that, speaking up and feeling comfortable, 
It's your sense of worth. You speak up because you're worried about something. You're seeing someone suffer. And if you then speak up and you're shut down, you're heading towards burnout and outcomes are going bad. So as leaders, we need to welcome psychological safety. We need to try to reduce this hierarchy we live in and look at it as a team together. And we want to try to reduce the moral distress by asking people to do things that are unreasonable, unreasonable. Some of the nurses we've spoken to who are in palliative care see patients who are end of life, 90 years old with Alzheimer's and with cancer, metastatic. And yet the rounding doctor will say, do a code because the family wants to do a code or do this or do that. And then they leave. But the nurse is left morally, knowing that this might not be the right thing for this patient. Respect that. Be have the nurses and aides comfortable talking about their moral distress and talking about it with psychological safety. We want to have our team members practice at the what we call the height of their license. Give them all the responsibility that they are able to do through their license. They're willing to do it if they have psychological safety, if they know they could speak up and be comfortable. It is very important to meet together, to be in your, your team groups. We at Schwartz Center have a program of sh called Schwartz Rounds, where we gather all the specialties together, all the professions, nurses, doctors, aides, translators, phlebotomists, radiation therapists, clerks, uh, information people, and we talk about a patient and what our patient shared patient experience was. We're not solving any problems. We're not saying you should have used this antibiotic or perhaps we shouldn't have done surgery. What we should we talk about is what was your experience, my experience? What did it like for me? What was the psychological stresses or emotional feelings that I was having caring for them? The emotional feelings telling your story. When we do mortality and morbidity conference, we list the problems, we tell what should have been done, but do we ever talk about what it feels like to have a complication, a complication of surgery? Did we ever ask what's the worst part of a complication for surgery? For many doctors, you know what they say? It is going around to see that patient day after day after day with that complication with the reminder. And I've said to my younger staff, hey, can I go around with you? The same thing has happened to me. This is this sharing my story, the surgeon's story, apart from the patient's story. It's hard to do. It's declaring our own vulnerability but we've all been through this and it's imp so important to be able to talk about it. Healing happens with relationships. These relationships that we develop, especially between team members is a social support. It's the support network we need. I like to say a word and about COVID, because all of what I was talking about was present before COVID, and it's still present. But COVID had added another layer. 
COVID presents a new additional type of stress. We have the fear of becoming infected and more importantly, the fear of affecting, infecting our family. The isolation is absolutely the antithesis of what we're talking about, team building and team being together. The economic stress that comes to ourselves, our family members, our relatives, our patients due to the lockdowns. We may be, do may be doing jobs we're not comfortable with doing. We may see nurses who've been outpatient in the clinic nurse called in to work in the ICU. So what might we think about now? What might we add to the list of things we've gone through? Reach out and inquire about how your teammates are doing. Are you feeling safe? It, are you, how do you get to feel calm? How to reduce the anxiety? Are you, who do you ask when you're doing a new job? How are you comfortable reaching out to your peers? How do you find hope? And most importantly, to be aware of one in oneself and of coworkers if they are having this whole process affecting their mental health. health. We have to have stop associating stigma of any kind with feeling mental health stress. We can't have it as embarrassment. We have to be able to let and encourage our staff to seek help, to seek help for their anxiety, safety, stress, without, without fear of stigma. And so I want to leave time for, for uh, conversation. And as uh, you mentioned, I work at the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare in Boston. And the founder was a man named Ken Schwartz. Ken Schwartz was a healthcare attorney who at age 40 uh, was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. And in spite of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, he died 11 months after diagnosis. Shortly before his death, he wrote an article which appeared in the Boston Sunday newspaper. And uh, it's available online. It's called A Patient's Story. And he described this harrowing experience for him and his family. And yet he wrote, the ordeal, this ordeal has been punctuated by moments of exquisite compassion. He wrote that he has been the recipient of an extraordinary array of human and humane responses. These acts of kindness, the simple human touch from my caregivers made the unbearable bearable. And that's compassion, making the unbearable bearable in our patients and in their families, the unbearable bearable in our team and coworkers and for relief for ourselves. Compassion provides hope for the patient. It gives support to the caregivers. It offers sustenance to the healing process. And it addresses our need for connection and for relationships. So I thank you very much for allowing me to talk. Treat one another with kindness and with compassion and treat yourself with kindness and compassion. So let us have a conversation. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, 
we've got a lot of questions lined up for for you from all that you've uh, covered so uh, i'll just uh, you know right at the beginning uh, you spoke about uh, uh, you know uh, getting uh, this exhaustion exhaustion of uh, your own empathy uh, and uh, this is something which uh, even i have experienced uh, that when you get too much emotionally involved and especially when you see some people who are suffering very badly and uh, Uh, as doctors we are all usually empathetic and emotionally involved and when it is when it gets to an extreme uh, you it just becomes very difficult to deal with in fact i had missed out one of our uh, monday motivation uh, uh, sessions because i was just in not enough frame of mind that day uh, so can you tell us more about that and i don't know how you can say that if the the more compassionate you are the better it is you will be able to fill up the, your speak up more Uh, but i just don't know how that works uh, and what are the ways in which you can uh, maintain your exhaustion is it do you should i take uh, multiple holidays <laughs> well you, you might it, the, the just the thing is that comes down to is how we are wired when we are wired to feel this compassion and this empathy feeling like patients it is affecting our own pain center that's happening we can see that on the functional mris but only when we could mitigate only when we could reduce that suffering does our reward center begin to brighten up that's the compassion side if we're working on only one side we're not going to get well we're going to describe exactly what you described this burnout exhaustion this empathetic exhaustion we know what our patients need and what our patients deserve and if we can't deliver that we're only going to be on the compassion side and we're not going to feel any reward whatsoever and when we can't feel any reward there's no way to combat those pain centers in our brain so we must must find ways to give that reward doesn't mean we spend 10 more minutes with patients doesn't mean we we find more effective ways to give them the drugs that are uncovered by their insurance it is that battle of what is it that's preventing us from lighting up our reward centers and it is why there's a responsibility of the organization to provide the things for you and it's a responsibility to look carefully at how do you refill that might well be that might well be more time off it might well be ways you can be nourished outside the healthcare system we see doctors and nurses going part time from full time because the path of exhaustion the path of this reaction to where we work this occupational problem can go to depression and can progress to suicidal ideation so i worry about you when you say you're feeling this way and it's important to recognize it and how can we act with your partners and your team to have you feel that you are delivering the care your patients need and deserve it's uphill a lot of the ways and binding and together and moving trying to move together towards whether it's administrative or what we're doing personally is critically important talk to your peers yeah thank you sir i i like the point where you said it could be different for everyone so you got to see what works best for you and involve your peers involve your uh, colleagues and uh, uh, i i i do use that i have a few mentors where whom i speak to whenever i'm in trouble uh, 
whenever I'm not sure what to do, and they do help out with their experience. Yeah. yeah. We, so, we are Dr. In this... Dhiren, sir. We are... Yeah, we're, we're in it together. Dr. Dhiren, sir, you wanted to ask? Yeah, sure. So, uh, Michael, I have a question. Like, your talk was mainly for the healthcare people, but the audience of this webinar is a lot of people, those who are not directly related to medical profession. There are many viewers who are known medical people. So, for them, how compassionate can be of help in their lives? You mentioned very well for the healthcare worker, but for the known health worker people group. So, how... For example, who, who are the example of the people I'm going to talk to now? What are their jobs? Okay, right. So basically, uh, I have sent your link to my known medical friends, like many of them are engineers. They are not actually uh, medical people and they understand very little about uh, the healthcare or like the interactions which we have with patients. So is there any importance of compassionate in, in their lives? I'm sure it is, but uh, how, how do you apply that? So anyone who is in a business that's serving someone else needs to be aware of compassion. You can be, uh, uh, if these are people you want in the hospital or outside of the hospital. Are you outside the hospital? To? Yeah, outside yeah. the hospital. And, and not related to medical. Yes, yeah. So they face the same dilemma. And that is that they know what their customers need and what their customers deserve. And they want to deliver that. If they recognize the need of their customer, whether they're shopping or having their car fixed or getting an airline ticket or uh, working in a shop, they know what their customer needs and deserves. And they want to fulfill that. I don't believe there are people who are out there solely to give you a hard time or who get joy. Look at your administrators. Do you think the administrators in the hospital are happy that they are reducing budget? Do you think they go home at night, the financial person in their office and say, my dear, I had a wonderful day. I fired four people. I mean, they, that's their m, &M. That's their, when you go into a coffee shop and they care about your experience and it matters what your experience is and they are delivering, they are feeling compassion. In fact, much of what we spoke about was learned in industry, was learned in industry. In the 1970s, they were studying industry and it said that the experience of the worker drives the experience of the customer. Do you know this Starbucks chain, Starbucks coffee? Yeah. Yes. So do you know that their, their uh, mission has nothing about coffee? Their mission is only the experience of the person who is the coffee drinker. That's why they're, they're, that's what they're interested in. People who are aware of that the experience of the worker drives the experience of the customer that worker says, this is a great place to work because I can deliver what the person needs. That's compassion. It doesn't have to be physical, medical uh, uh, needs. It could be meeting service needs. Teachers, teachers, if they're trying to deliver education to their students, if they can't do it, 
they suffer burnout the same way we did in doctors. In fact, Maslach, who was the de developer of the famous burnout index and coined the name, had nothing to do with doctors. She spoke with teachers and social workers. So maybe we should still learn from those who are not in the medical profession what they're sustaining. Okay, uh, then I have a other question. Like we use, uh, uh, like we understand that altruism is very useful quality in the life. So how do you see altruism and compassion as, as like what is the relation between the two? Are they interrelated or they are completely different concept? Well, I think that um, uh, a lot of the concepts kind of overlap one another and we define them and there's been some very specific definitions of the difference between sympathy and empathy and compassion and altruism, mostly because the neuroscientists who have done work on this with functional MRI see that there are slightly different processes in the brain. So they are related to one another with some overlap. And so that's why we perhaps artificially define some of them differently when in truth there are some overlap. Altruism is, is, um, is uh, our personal feeling, this is at least the way I think about it, of doing good. I have a choice of doing good or not doing good. I feel I want to do good. I, it matters to me if I do good. And that's what the altruism, and why do people choose to do good? And why do some people not? I think that the altruism and the nurturing of that and all the factors that go in have us to choose good. And that's what brings us to healthcare because I think we see even as children and teenagers, we see the opportunity for doing good. And doing good is to recognize the suffering in the patient and doing good is to relieve and mitigate that suffering, and that's compassion. Yes, over to you, Satyan. Yes, uh, Dr. Goldberg, uh, there is a question from uh, Dr. Tushar Agarwal, who is our co-moderator here. Uh, he, uh, uh, you know, he made a point that uh, uh, some people are more empathetic than others. Uh, more altruistic than others, as we were discussing now. And uh, he wants to know what would actually help people to improve their sense of empathy or improve uh, altruism. And he's a big fan of neuroplasticity. Does that work? Uh, you know, would, would that be helpful? Okay. So um, the, the description is quite true. We all have, we all have uh, uh, empathy. What this found is if you look at the two components, emotional empathy and cognitive empathy, we see that there is a difference in people. Some people have a lot of cognitive empathy. They understand, but they're not very much feeling affected. And some other people may feel much more of an emotional empathy, but not have the, the cognitive component. There have been a number of, um, of studies done to show that you can enhance both empathy and, and um, uh, cognitive aspects, both cognitive and emotional aspects. And Klemenke and Singer, uh, to look up their work, 
they've done a number of studies where they've done functional MRI, empathy training, functional MRI, compassion training, and this training is using videos and other things, and compared it to those who had functional MRI and just memory training. And they have shown structural changes, functional changes in the brain and in the intensity of how things have lit up. Um, uh, and, um, and those studies show that on a physiologic basis, you can see the electrical and some anatomic changes. And there's quite a bit of work on that area. In addition, there's some social uh, studies have been um, uh, done in which uh, medical students, resident, medical students and residents had specific empathy training, specific empathy training. And then they were assessed at the beginning, a group who had empathy training and those who did not, and they were assessed by their patients measuring, their patients measuring whether they perceive more empathy than not. And they showed both increase and in the two different groups. And this was, um, uh, it, 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 this work is, and if um, you want some references, I'm happy to send some of that literature to anyone who, who asks about, um, yeah, about that. Could. But you can do it. And it is trainable, and it is it, it, it's like any other skill. Okay. Okay. Uh, then, when I was a trainee orthopedic resident, uh, my professors and my seniors they told me that uh, fine, empathy is important, but don't become too much emotional to the patient. Otherwise, that will drain you too much of your emotions and will make you emotionally fatigued person. And what you say today is absolutely, uh, opposite. completely opposite. Yes. So, <laughs> Who is right? <laughs> so, yeah, so that is what the question is like. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... Um, um, that the teaching of not getting involved with your patient and uh, has not worked. Uh, the, the distancing from patients, we don't want you to be sick, but we also don't want the patient to be dehumanized. The fact that the, the uh, talk to our customers Talk to our customers. I hate to use that word for patients. And if only, if we asked, are you being treated kindly? Are you being treated with compassion? And fewer than half say yes, there's something wrong. I understand this detachment. I understand it was an extension. Don't take care of your own family members. Don't operate on your mother and doing those sort of things. But the idea to not develop a relationship with patients and with one another, the idea not to know of people as people, to not recognize what's important to the people who are entrusting their lives to us is a mistake. I think that when we don't know or care uh, about, we have to care not only for our patients and treating them, we have to care about our patients and our coworkers. And I think doing that, doing that is what's gonna nourish us. Ignoring them is not. It's not going to be good for them, and it's not going to be good for us. With all respect to your professors. Yeah, thank you. Over to you, Satyan, for summarizing and then word of thanks. Yeah, 
thank you sir uh, thank you dr goldberg uh, with your permission uh, i'd like to summarize uh, this session and uh, and maybe we can end it uh, you feel free to interrupt me any time i'm quite used to being interrupted <laughs> so so you've spoken about a lot of things a lot of good things and uh, i just wanted to uh, point out a few which really uh, struck a chord with me uh, you talked about uh, controlling your own emotions uh, while having empathy while having sympathy uh, you know giving time to the patient was a very important thing i i have also realized that when i'm not rushed and when i'm talking to them comfortably giving them enough time uh, to to speak uh, to and also for myself to speak uh, they are much more comfortable uh, i think they you know they repeatedly ask the same questions again uh, two or three times but you need to be uh, patient and be able to compassionately answer them uh, every time is uh, was a very good uh, pointer uh, you said uh, that you know you you must ask the patient what they want to be called Uh, you you don't uh, need to just uh, read mr or mrs so and so you what do they want to be called and that's a very good point which uh, which i think a lot of what would, would like would uh, like to incorporate in our practice um you also said that uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, uh, interrupt the patient after 19 seconds of them start <laughs> with <laughs> which uh, which i think is one second too many maybe it should uh, around 18 seconds is, is my limit <laughs> but yes i know we should uh, let them speak speak up uh, and uh, you know get everything off their chest before we we start uh, asking them the right questions and directing them to the place where we need them a uh, very important take away for me was how do i make uh, myself emotionally strong and uh, ready to be compassionate again and again and uh, uh, exercise regular exercise uh, is very helpful regular sleep habits eating healthy leading a healthy lifestyle meditation uh, is something which a lot of us are doing uh, and uh, it's also very useful um, you have uh, i have extracted one more point which i wanted from you was taking multiple holidays so whenever i take a holiday i'm going to say dr goldberg has advised me to take a holiday <laughs> <laughs> and and refresh myself um, a very important point sir is uh, whenever my wife starts shouting i'm going to tell her bad things scream and good things whisper so uh, just try try to take it in a funny way sir but i understand your point that you know you just have to keep your ear out for good things uh, think about the three small good things that happen in a day to keep yourself fresh because the the bad things are just going to jump on you and you it will not uh, you know you cannot ignore them but these good things you may just take it for granted it may just be as simple as having a nice cup of tea or coffee with your friend uh, maybe after surgery uh, a very important point uh, which you uh, came uh, which you brought up rather surprisingly for me was uh, the leadership uh, qualities and compassion in leadership uh, and uh, you know when we are working in an operating theater or also people who are working with their teams Uh, when they you know you make them feel comfortable make them feel as they are part of the team they can speak to speak up they can speak their mind and not be reprimanded for it you know is a very good thing uh, if you know uh, recently uh, the indian cricket team uh, uh, beat australia with uh, a very compassionate leader as uh, jinke rahane and he led uh, the whole team as a team where everybody was allowed to speak up so i i think uh, it's at the at the right time the most appropriate time that you brought up thought about compassionate in leadership as well so uh, i thank you dr goldberg uh, and uh, it was an excellent session where we have picked up a lot of points and uh, we really need to in, uh, incorporate compassion in our everyday life and i think it will uh, help to avoid problems in today's medico legal world as well it would help to avoid those and you may, you will also be able to sleep as a uh, sleep well at night as a uh, uh, you know happy and satisfied uh, doctor and human being uh, i'd like to thank uh, dr dhiren ganjwala sir uh, always steady as a rock as a pillar in all our sessions and always uh, keeping us on the right uh, track uh, and uh, other fellows dr uh, tushar agarwal uh, and i'd like to thank ortho tv dr vijnani is back uh, he knows that it's time he may have to conduct another session soon Uh, thank you ortho tv for uh, having this we are reaching our 50th episode now and i'd like to thank our audience uh, for uh, being with us uh, through this journey and hope to get you better
and better uh, topics, more and more different topics, so that we can keep learning and improving and becoming better, compassionate human beings. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Neeraj, yeah, you can stop.